I am delighted to be part of this panel today, uh, partly because Heidi and Brian are such great people with whom to be on a panel, and partly because sharing special collections is a topic that's been dear to my heart for quite a number of years, and there were times when I thought I'd never see this day. Let's see how I can advance there. So the work that Heidi, Brian, and their colleagues is doing is as timely as it is bold and valuable. It's timely because in an era when research library administrators increasingly think of the collective collection as an asset held in common, our libraries shall be known by those holdings that are distinct, valuable, rare, even unique. Their work is bold because to share special collections, even as digital surrogates, is to throw yourself headlong into the potential minefield of your institution's attitude toward risk. Their work is valuable because to expect people from all around the world to travel to your shop in order to access special collections items under your care is in a very real way to stand in the path of the creation of new knowledge. So when I say I'm delighted to see this work going on among the Ivy Plus group and the Big Ten, please take me at my word. Fifteen years ago, I worked for an organization called Research Libraries Group and we put together a conference on sharing special collections held in Washington, D.C. For me, perhaps the most memorable presentation at that conference was about um, how a project launched within a consortium of top-tier ARLs went badly off the rails, how not to share special collections. The conference attendees came away fired up about the possibilities, and the vibe was one of hope. I then formed a working group of experts from the library community to conduct a pilot project, one where we would uh, establish some best practices for sharing special items and then actually share them. And sadly, we too went off the rails. You see some of the reasons listed there on the slide. Sharing special collections in 2002 was an idea whose time had definitely not yet come. Flash forward to 2009. Now as we're working for OCLC Research, we had a steering group advising us on work relating to special collections, work that led to the publication of these two reports pictured here. Just FYI, these authors uh, listed here were not members of the steering committee. They did the actual work uh, in several areas suggested by the steering committee. Um, back then, the idea whose time had come was allowing digital cameras in reading rooms. Sharing special collections materials with patrons and other libraries was still a pretty radical idea to many. The steering group recommended that we do a project on sharing special collections, then abruptly changed their minds, then bravely put the idea back on the table. So I guess take another crack at this. We formed a working group. Of course we did. We made up of teams of ILL and special collections people from institutions affiliated with the OCLC Research Library Partnership. The teams came in with varying amounts of exposure to the idea of physically sharing special collections. Um, we also had access to an advisory group of folks who were interested in the idea of sharing special collections, and many of them were already actively doing so. We stayed in close contact with an RBMS task force that was revising the ACRL's guidelines for sharing special collections, and we packed the hearings held by the RBMS task force at ALA Annual with ILL experts who, I am told, had not weighed in on previous revisions of the guidelines. One of the first things we did, aside from the requisite literature review, was to conduct a survey about current practice and attitudes regarding the sharing of special collections. We cast a pretty wide net, posted the link on all manner of international primary sources and ILL listservs, and received something like 88 responses, so not exactly a, a huge sample size. But we found that most of those who responded were already sharing physical items from their special collections, at least under certain conditions. I received a bit of pushback throughout the project, sometimes rather emotional pushback. Some seemed to think that sharing physical items from special collections was going to be the source of some very bad mojo, possibly bring on the end of days, at least for library science. But we pushed on. On we did push. So first a comment about the report's title there. My idea, Tears for Fears, spelled T-I-E-R-S instead of T-E-R-S. So clever. The reason um, for the alternative spelling will be clear in a moment, but in retrospect, I wish we'd named it Sharing Special Collections for Smarties. All that cleverness made the report harder to find. We started out by coming to an agreement on some first principles that we felt were pretty solid and reasonable, certainly not the work of crazy-eyed zealots. The answer when someone wants to borrow a physical item from special collections is still usually no. 
Most often there's a better solution than lending the item. Duh. Not everything in Special Collections is equally special. I'm looking at you, oral history transcripts. And why not let those who are good at something do it? Like I love people who know how to package stuff good and totally rock at monitoring its use. We then proceeded to create tools that folks out in the wild could actually use if they could figure out how to find my report with a clever title. A model written policy on sharing special collections. Add in your specifics. Keep the parts you care about. Delete the parts you don't. A checklist for communicating with a library where they want to borrow one of your special items, but you're not already part of a trusted network with them, and you'd like to know a little bit about the setup at their shop. I'll say more about this checklist in a moment, and you'll get a better look at it, so you can actually see what's on it then. And finally, a tiered approach to sorting out workflows for requests to borrow your special collections items. Again, you'll get a better look at this in a second. Some requests to borrow special collections may require the utmost care and deep consultation with every expert on your staff before a decision is reached. That would be the yellow column, which used to be how we treated every request to borrow something from our special collections, if we were willing to consider the request at all. Other requests may be for materials that fall into a class where the ILO staff can decide and act on their own authority. That would be the green column over on the left. Or there may be requests that fall somewhere in the middle, the gray area, as it were. You see what I did there. This tool will help your ILO people and your special collections experts sort through the issues. And that's where the tears for fears come in. Fear is not too strong of a word here. Basically, your attitude towards sharing special collections materials boils down to your tolerance for risk. Institutional tolerance, which comes from the top down, and sometimes personal tolerance because we've all seen cases where all it takes is just one person within an organization to say no about something, and that can be the end of the conversation. I certainly don't mean to minimize what's at stake here when it comes to sharing special collections. The rare, fragile, and valuable items in our care must be protected. Often they're impossible to replace. It would be irresponsible to share them without sober and systematic consideration and without taking adequate precautions. But it's a conversation that can and should be had within an organization or within a consortium. It's our professional responsibility to protect the materials in our care, absolutely. It's also our professional responsibility to constantly question our values and principles and especially how we do things. You can walk through the three tiers here and begin to imagine what the conversation between your ILO people and special collection staff might sound like. As promised, here's a closer look at the facilities trust checklist. The working group members spent a lot of time on this, articulating what's required in order to be considered a trusted host of borrowed special collections materials, and laboring to keep the list to a dozen essential points that fit on one page. The checklist can be useful in two distinct ways. It can serve as a conversation starter between libraries to establish expectations and ultimately trust. It can also serve as a request from frontline staff to library administrators that we need to up our game locally if we want to be able to borrow special items for our researchers. We had a team from Penn State join our working group mid-project. The special collections person, Sandra Steltz, and the ILO person, Barbara Coopy, both since retired, had uh, attended a webinar that our working group put on called Treasures on Trucks, and they decided to take the plunge. They had the internal conversations, they sorted out the workflows for various classes of special collections materials. They shared equipment and cross-trained staff. And they moved special collections materials between the vault and the ILO office in special tubs acquired especially for this purpose, which soon became the object of extreme envy from others working in the library who saw these special tubs being carted back and forth between the two departments and, of course, coveted them. Penn State got to yes very often, it turns out, when asked for items from their special collections. For me, seeing them embrace the concept and truly walk the walk was like a dream come true. So that brings me to, um, oops, not, not advancing anymore. There we go. That brings me to the end of my remarks. I'm excited to hear what Heidi and Brian have to say about the projects in which they and their consortia are involved. Um, let it be known that sharing special collections at long last is definitely an idea whose time has come. So thanks for listening, and please type any questions or comments you have in chat. We'll address them after the presentations. So over to Heidi. Marilyn, what has to happen next?
Uh, I have passed the ball to Heidi, and she's ready to go. Fantastic. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Sounds great. Okay, great. So welcome. Um, I'm Heidi Nance. I'm the Director of Resource Sharing Initiatives for the Ivy Plus Libraries um, Partnership. And um, I was, I'm was i so pleased to be here talking to you today about a, a subject that is near and dear to my heart. And that was absolutely a wonderful introduction, Dennis. I really appreciate that. And um, I also want to say thank you to, to OCLC for um, hosting this webinar, which is an extension of a presentation that Dennis and Brian and I gave at the OCLC Resource Sharing Conference and for uh, making a live webinar and, and the recording available later. That's, that's just absolutely wonderful. So um, I'm thrilled to be here today talking to you about this. Um, I am here mostly to tell you about a pilot project that we have going on within our partnership and our consortia around the scanning of special collections materials. And I know that Brian will be following up to talk about work that's being done in the Big Ten Academic Alliance. So I think between the two of us, you're going to get a really interesting window into two very different ways that you, either as an institution or as a consortia, might approach um, might approach this conversation. And I think that um, Dennis set it up really, really well when he was talking about the importance of trust because I have found that the communication and the trust piece is, is so absolutely critical and it takes time to grow. And by trust, I mean trust between your interlibrary loan staff and the special collection staff, trust between your users to handle the materials appropriately, trust between institutions, and, and trust is a fragile thing. And, and I think that it's important to recognize how easily that can be broken um, through a mistake. Or, or simply through not paying attention and valuing this. On the other hand, I have also seen some absolutely amazing things happen when trust is there, when users are able to access materials that they really can't get anywhere else. And I think that also supports the mission of your institution, which is obviously primarily to serve your local users, but the more that you can demonstrate value of your collections in supporting the larger resource um, sharing community and the larger research community, I think is just so incredibly valuable. So as you can tell, I'm excited about this topic. So I will tell you a little bit about what we're doing within our group. Um, and hopefully there will be something here that, that will be useful for you to take away as you think about this project. So a little bit about who Ivy Plus is and what Borrow Direct is. So Ivy Plus is a group, um, I sometimes joke that we're a semi-autonomous collective of 13 different institutions. We have Brown, we have Columbia, Cornell, Dartmouth, Duke, Harvard, Johns Hopkins, MIT, Princeton, Stanford, University of Chicago, University of Pennsylvania, and Yale University Libraries. So at present, the core of our resource sharing offerings has been the Borrow Direct program, which is a a uh, highly automated system through which we share physical materials uh, has not included special collections and still at, at, at present does not include special collections for the sharing of physical materials. Um, but we do share almost uh, over a quarter of a million items um, per year. We have a 40 average delivery time that is dropping and a steady 95% fill rate. Um, what's also not listed here, which is very interesting, is that we've seen a steady growth in the sharing of materials through the service over the years. We've had an average of a 7% growth each year. Um, this year, I think it's up about 3%. And I think that that's especially interesting in an era where print circulation and use of print materials is generally on the decline. So that's very, very, I think, useful. It speaks to the, the value of the service. I think what's also interesting, too, is that users will frequently begin their research or, or their, their career at one of these institutions and then move on to be either a researcher or a postdoc or even a faculty member at another institution and they use the service when they move between institutions. So that's been really, really exciting exciting to see. So all of this to point out that there was a strong ethos of resource sharing and, and again that trust, that trust that had built up between these institutions over the years through this established program, but as I said, it did not include the sharing of special collections materials. So how did our, our pilot get started? Well, it really frankly started as a hallway conversation. I, I wish I could say something more exciting or more strategic or more thoughtful than that, but really that's how it began. Uh, this is a photo of the Mansueto Library at the University of Chicago that I visited last June when I first began this position. And I had a conversation with their special collections librarian, and I, I learned that he had co-authored a white paper on the sharing of special collections materials through resource sharing, and, and I got very excited, and we began talking about it a little bit more. 
Um, I then returned to my home institution at the University of Pennsylvania and mentioned this to my supervisor who said, well, gosh, you know, we have a scan on demand pilot for our local patrons for resharing of these materials through resource sharing, or excuse me, just, just on demand for our local users. Why don't we start a pilot with the University of Chicago? So I reached out to Chicago and said, hey, you know, would, would you be interested in, in trying this out? And they said, absolutely, that sounds like a great idea, but we would want to open it up to other participants. We would want to see if there were other Ivy Plus and Borough Direct Libraries who'd be interested in participating. So I, I sent out a call for participation. Uh, I said, hey, you know, who's interested in trying this out? If you're interested, please fill out this doodle poll to look for a time that we can all meet and just talk about what this might look like. I was not asking anyone to commit at that particular juncture. It was really just a who, hey, who's interested in having a, a broader conversation about this. So um, to my great delight, there were a number of institutions that immediately stepped up and said, yes, this is, this is important to us. This is who we are. This is what we want to try. We're, we're brave. We're willing. And that was Brown, Chicago, Duke, Johns Hopkins, Penn, and Yale. Um, what I think is especially interesting about Yale was that um, they were only able at that time to, to uh, offer access to binary key materials, so some of their especially rare and especially special uh, special collections materials, which I think also speaks to some of the evolving nature of this pilot, which is rather than have it be an all or nothing, both in terms of who was participating and what materials they were using, it became a let's at least contribute what we can. Let's do at least a little bit more than what we were doing before. So with this group, uh, we had one call for interest. We created a task force. We had six meetings in seven weeks, which I think is a remarkable feat in and of itself. I cannot, there were far more than, than six doodle polls. I can assure you of that. Uh, and it took quite a bit of schedule wrangling um, and I, what I call um, calendar gymnastics. And not everyone was able to make it to every meeting, so we were very careful to take very clear notes and document what we were discussing. And, uh, and we were able to come up with seven guidelines to guide our work and to guide the work of the pilot. What I think is especially interesting and that isn't listed here is that it was not just resource sharing people who were part of the task force. We also included digitization specialists. We included special collections representatives, as well as resource sharing practitioners and as heads of access services and um, heads of access services at Beinecke, in fact. So this was really, I think this diversity and this cross-functional approach was one of the most significant aspects to ensuring that this was successful. So we weren't just stuck in an echo chamber and we weren't stuck on questions where we had to circle back to someone else and come back for answers. We had the majority of the information we needed present at each meeting. So I'll quickly go through the guidelines um, that we came up with, and I realize these are text-heavy slides, but I wanted to be sure to offer these for you so that you could see them um, and look at these slides later and perhaps share them. So we already had a reciprocal interlibrary loan policy where materials that, for whatever reason, um, weren't being shared through Bar Direct but went through interlibrary loan between our libraries, would all, we would already not charge for that. So we decided that rather than reinventing the wheel, what we would do is extend our existing policy to also apply to scans of special collections materials. We would stop charging each other for those scans. We also decided that um, there are a number of different ways that requests for scans of special collections materials can come into a library. They don't always come through interlibrary loan and they don't always come directly to special collections. They can come in a variety of ways. So what we thought was, well, let's, instead of forcing the user to turn around and go replace their request in a particular system or go and talk to so-and-so, let's say, let's just honor the request the way that it came in. So if the request came in through interlibrary loan, we would find a way to work with special collections to get that. If it came in directly to special collections, they would find a way to share the information with the resource sharing practitioners um, if they needed their support in filling that request. So we were really sort of trying to move the service to where the user was rather than trying to move the user to where the service was. Turnaround time. This was something that we spent quite a bit of time talking about. And where we landed was that um, it is not reasonable to expect a standard interlibrary loan turnaround time for these types of requests. Um, we talk a lot about automation and streamlining and resource sharing for very good reasons. But to my mind, one of the reasons that you automate is so that you are able to save time for those things that do require more intense 
attention and more intense focus. And this is in that latter category of things that just simply take longer because they are a different type of animal. So what we agreed was that our goal would be to provide the scans within two weeks or less but that we fully recognized that some items could indeed take longer. And as long as we were communicating back to the patron what a reasonable expectation was for digitization, that that was sufficient. And most users were just thrilled to have the scan. So this has not been an issue at all. Scan quality was also something that came up. Uh, participating libraries will scan items according to each library's internal standards. So at the beginning, there was a real desire to scan all of these materials at a very high quality scan that would be archival quality and retention quality, and then to put them into a repository, which is a fantastic idea. But what we discovered is that um, not all libraries were set up to do that on demand, and that some items might not be appropriate to scan at that very high quality. Um, if somebody was only requesting one image or one plate or one chapter, did it make sense to only scan that at high quality and add it to a repository? And where we landed was that this should be at the discretion of the library, it should be at the discretion of the digitization specialist or the selector, and that if this was something they wanted to add to their repository, that they should do so, but that we weren't going to stipulate that as a requirement for participation. We left that to their discretion, which has been very interesting and also very useful. Um, eligible library patrons. This was something else that we came up with was, you know, there were only a group of about five or six of us who were, who were on the pilot group who were talking about this. And at first, the sense was, well, if we're going to pilot this, we should only be honoring requests from each other's patrons, not from all 13 libraries. But after some discussion, we decided that we would rather encourage participation from all of the libraries through inclusion rather than through exclusion. And so what we did was we decided that we would offer the service to all Ivy Plus Libraries patrons, regardless of whether their library was also scanning for this pilot. Um, and I was, I was really pleased to see the level of support for this idea and that there was not a lot of resistance. And I have, I will say this has been quite effective in bringing other people to the table for the conversation because the majority of the users, interestingly enough, are, are not necessarily from um, pilot participating libraries. So that's been a very useful conversation topic. We identified a pilot period, um, which was entirely based on practicality. It took us until about October 1st to, to come up with these guidelines and really communicate them and clarify them and get full sign off. So we began last October. It will run through this coming October, but we do want to begin a program review process as of July 11th, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And we also ask that people to uh, report their statistics quarterly. And statistics are an evolving, um, an evolving process because we, um, we wanted statistics ideally from both the borrowing and the lending library, but that wasn't always feasible. So we're still refining the process for gathering those, but we are able to get a list of things that were requested, things that were filled, and things that were unfilled, and what the reasons for unfilled were. So this is an example image I wanted to show you um, that was scanned at uh, Penn Libraries for a Harvard uh, patron, which I think is, is really, really absolutely fantastic, and I love seeing this image. And then this is something that was scanned um, at Beinecke for a user at Columbia. So if you look at this slide, you know I know that Harvard is not a participating library and also that um, Columbia is not a participating library, although both of them are very interested in participating. And I think the fact that their users are making use of this service has been a really wonderful conversation starter with those libraries who are very eager to participate and we're continuing to have that conversation. Um, it's been really helpful. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but it's been helpful to have people participate as they were able in order to sort of pave the way and identify processes for the future libraries. So very quickly about workflow, um, another thing that was important to us was that we not invent a separate and parallel workflow for this process. We really wanted to make sure that we, as much as we could, um, worked this into the existing workflows that all, were already established and already um, working very well. So for Chicago, for example, the request may come into ILL and then they automatically can transfer that into Aon. At Penn, um, the request may come into ILL, and then sometimes they circle back to the borrowing library before passing the request on to Aon. For at Johns Hopkins, they had a very, very interesting approach, um, which was they actually created a separate Iliad instance um, or a separate Iliad NVTGC 
in order to um, pass a request over to that um, Iliad instance for, in the Special Collections area for scanning. So very quickly, here we are looking at the request. This is just for the first quarter from October 1 until the end of December. And there weren't very many requests, which I thought, at first I was slightly disappointed by, but then I realized that that was actually a, a fantastic um, example of why the fear that we would be deluged with, with hundreds of thousands of requests from scans from all of these users really didn't play out in reality. And if you look at the reasons for unfilled, you have lack, other, lost, not found as cited, unavailable, canceled by borrower, copyright, not owned, and policy. Almost none of these, perhaps, except perhaps other, almost none of these are ones that are related to condition of the item. So that was very, very eye-opening to me. And then very quickly, here are some sample titles. I just thought those were interesting. I'm going to move along quickly to be sure I leave plenty of time for Brian. And then briefly, I want to just talk about evaluation that we hope to do in July. One of the pieces that I would really love to be able to get at is the value to the user. What did this service enable them to do that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise? Was this scan used in a publication? Was it used in a grant proposal? You know, was this something that they wouldn't have been able to accomplish their research or their scholarship without? And so that's something I hope to be able to, to touch on a little bit in evaluation. We want to look at the reasons that the volume is low and see if there is an issue with the request process and see if we can identify some, some uh, fixes there. And we want to look at the workflow process as well and see if there are ways to identify that. So briefly, as I said, here are our next steps. And then in concluding thoughts, I, I was trying to think about what the key takeaways were from our particular experience with this pilot. And I think that really it is 90% about emotions and 10% about the workflow. Um, I think getting all of the stakeholders at the table to really talk about this and, and have an honest conversation about their fears and about concerns and to have those be truly listened to and addressed and not minimized is absolutely critical and to try to find a way to acknowledge those and move through them. Um, build on existing workflows is important. Also have an opt-in model. Don't, don't necessarily force everyone to participate and, ha and don't necessarily require that people scan from all of their collections. Again, Yale's only scanning from Beinecke. Maybe pick what you can do. And then lastly, you know, while we want to get to yes, sometimes yes is even a little too optimistic. Maybe our goal can be to move from no to a maybe. So we just at least pause and consider whether this is something that we can do. So I see that there are a bunch of fantastic questions in the chat, and I definitely hope to get to some of those at the end. But at this point, I think I should turn it over to Brian to talk about um, the Big Ten's approach, which is quite different and also equally wonderful. Great, thank you, Heidi. Hey, everybody, I'm Brian Miller, head of Interlibrary Services at Ohio State University. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about recent efforts to share special collections in the Big Ten Academic Alliance. For anyone unfamiliar, the Big Ten Academic Alliance is 14 large universities partnered with the University of Chicago and stretching from the Great Plains to the Mid-Atlantic. Uh, the Big Ten collectively handles about one and a half million ILL borrowing and lending requests with all libraries each year. And that's through OCLC, DocLine, Rapid, state consortial systems, our Big Ten U Borrow system, et cetera. And seven of our institutions are also among the top 10 lenders on OCLC. So there's a whole lot of resource sharing going on in the Big Ten. Now, the Big Ten libraries have had a general resource sharing agreement for many years, uh, and that governs how we share our materials with each other. And it has very pro-ILL language in it about sharing materials as broadly as possible with minimal restrictions and rare, fragile, non-print materials might be lent through a negotiated process. But in talking with some of my consortial peers, it would seem that we were each interpreting or applying that language a little differently. Um, and while I think we've all been doing a really good job of lending items uh, to each other from our general collections, including loaning normally non-circulating items like bound journal volumes, audiovisual items, and microformats 
my sense was that there were wide disparities in how we were interacting and sharing special collection items. Uh, and not just across the different Big Ten institutions, but also across different special collections units at the same institution. So about a year ago, I did a survey of my Big Ten peers to gauge the level of collaboration between our ILL offices and special collections units. And we discovered that the 15 of us have 61 special collections units, a unit being a distinct collection, usually with its own curator and some measure of policy control over that collection. And of the 15 of us, 12 were filling copy requests from 43 of the special collections, so about 70%, and eight of us, 53%, were filling loan requests from only nine special collections, um, about 15%. So definitely there seemed to be room for some improvement. <laughs> In the spring of 2017, the Big Ten ILL has authorized me to form a task force to see what improvements might be possible. And I had several willing colleagues from our ILL heads group with varying levels of experience working with their special collections who volunteered to join. And we decided if we're going to do this right, we really ought to have special collections representatives also join us at the table so our two groups could learn about opportunities and concerns from each other. And just like there is a Big Ten ILL heads group, there's also a Big Ten special collections heads group, and we asked them for the volunteers. And we found some wonderful enthusiasm on their part to have that conversation and promote use and knowledge of their collections, with, you know, which they're rightfully proud of and they want people to see and use. So our task force quickly determined that there were two main questions we needed to answer. First, what are our consortial values that we all agree to? In other words, why would we want to share special collections with each other? What's the goal in doing that? And answering that question eventually became our principles and the persuasive part of why we're all going to do this. And secondly, um, what are the expectations we have for requesting and supplying these special collections items? In other words, how are we going to do this? And are there some rules we can all agree to so we're all on the same page? And it turns out there are, and these became our protocols. We had no idea how long any of this was going to take, but here you can see the timeline our task force experienced. It took about five months over four phone calls um, and assigned tasks outside those calls to research and draft our principles and protocols. And once we had that first draft, our task force took it to all the Big Ten ILL heads and special collections heads groups over a two-month period to gather additional feedback and refinement. And our task force members uh, also agreed that the Big Ten preservation officers should have a say in this. Um, they know a lot about digitization and proper handling of materials, so we presented it to them and got additional feedback um, for tweaks. And lastly, uh, a final draft went to the Big Ten library directors themselves for approval, which came just last month. The last step then is to take this broad consortial framework and develop local procedures at each of our Big Ten institutions to implement it. And I should mention that our task force did not invent the wheel here um, and that our principles and protocols document was heavily inspired by Dennis's Tears for Fears document and the ACRL RBMS guidelines for interlibrary and exhibition loan of special collections materials. So we're standing on the shoulders of others who really laid a foundation for us. And if you want to read our Big Ten consortial document, you'll find our principles and protocols for interlibrary loan of special collections materials at the URL on your screen. And Marilee is going to place that link in the chat window for everyone. On the screen, you're seeing sort of the preamble to the document that defines our overarching goals for borrowing, lending, and digitizing special collections through interlibrary loan. But what's in this document? Well, First, we have our three simple principles, access, preservation, and collaboration. By access, we agree to no blanket rejections of requests. In other words, we agree to case-by-case -case consideration for special collections from our Big Ten partners. 
And I should clarify, the document addresses only what we agree to with each other in the Big Ten, but not requests to or from non-Big Ten libraries, which each of our institutions will get to decide for itself how to address. The second Big Ten principle is preservation. We're going to digitize when possible, loan as a last resort, and it's okay to say no when condition or circumstances warrant. We're not agreeing to lend everything to each other. We are agreeing, though, to consider each request. And lastly, the last principle is collaboration, that we're all in this together as a common Big Ten community within and across our institutions with the same end goal of furthering research and teaching. And to promote that, we're breaking down barriers between our ILL, special collections, and preservation communities. The other half of the agreement is the protocols. And you can see on screen our standard Big Ten usage and shipping conditions for special collections physical loans. Um, but of course, each Big Ten library can apply additional restrictions for a particular piece as needed. Note the first condition, special collections reading room use only. This is different from the more generic in library use only phrase because Special collections reading room use means that the patron's use will be supervised by library staff in a controlled reading room. It does not mean unsupervised use anywhere in the library, like in library use only might imply. And I think that's an important distinction. Uh, the rest of the conditions here I think are pretty self-explanatory. Um, and very similar to the Interlibrary Loan Code for the United States, we have defined responsibilities for the borrowing and lending libraries for special collections. So on the borrowing side, we've agreed that getting physical items from special collections should be a last resort. The borrower should have exhausted all other domestic options first to try and borrow a title from a general collection somewhere, and then if that fails to happen, consult with their user to see if a special collection loan is acceptable before resubmitting the request to a Big Ten partner. And we partially came to this conclusion from a pilot program here at Ohio State where if a lending request came in for a particular special collection, um, we as the lender used to go directly to our curator and they would often say yes and we would conditional with our restrictions, but then half the time we never heard anything back from the borrowing library, which was wasting our curator's time with items sitting on their desk ready to go out, but the request never came back to us. Um, so presumably, either those borrowing libraries went and found a general circulating copy elsewhere, or they or their patron didn't want a special collections item. So now, Big Ten borrowing libraries agree that if a Big Ten lender conditionals to say this is a special collections item, the borrower will continue through the lending string and exhaust other domestic libraries for a general circulating copy first, Next, check with their user to see if a special collections loan with restrictions would be acceptable. And then if so, go back to the Big Ten lender who had conditional and say to that lender in a borrowing note, you know, we've tried elsewhere to no avail, we've consulted with our user, and now we'd like consideration from your curator. And the borrower is also placing the lender three times in the lending string of the new request um, for the lender to work through that consideration. On the lending side, uh, copies is really the low-hanging fruit here, uh, and we all agree to accept and fill scan requests for articles and chapters if possible. And for loan requests that are agreed to, we're going to document conditions of special collections pieces before we lend them and include paperwork uh, identifying any pre-existing conditions with pieces um, and our usage restrictions. So those are the broad brushstrokes that we've agreed to at the consortial level. Now, each of our Big Ten institutions are obligated to create or revise written procedures for implementing this framework locally. So for example, here at Ohio State, I convened a small group of ILL, preservation and reformatting, and special collections representatives to work out our workflows for borrowing and lending special collections. 
Some things we were already doing, uh, like lending copies fulfillment, and we just needed to update our existing documentation. But others we had to create from scratch, like what happens when another library's special collections item arrives for our user? We had kind of been dealing with that ad hoc in the past and really had nothing written, but now we do. And if anyone is interested, you can see our procedures here at Ohio State if you go to the URL on screen. And this is hot off the presses. We just finalized these last week. Uh, there are really four components. Um, borrowing loans is the first, and we answer things like, where is the item going to be kept here? How is it checked out to the user? What if the patron asks for a scan from it? Which department is going to do that? Um, second component deals with lending loans. Uh, what does the ILL office do before the request goes to Special Collections? Who in Special Collections reviews that request and using what criteria? Who packages the item and how? Um, that's all in there in these procedures. Uh, third is lending copies. How are those requests reviewed and routed? And who does the scanning? Who delivers the files? And the one section that's still a work in progress for us here at OSU is digitizing entire works that are in the public domain and not already digitized by someone else. Um, we have some key staff vacancies to fill here and we're hoping to tackle uh, that component of our procedures later this summer. Now, if the procedures I've described are way too much in the weeds, way too much detail, we also have simplified one-page flowcharts for each process that has gray boxes for action items, blue boxes for decision points, and reddish boxes for terminal statuses. And those are at the link at the bottom of this slide. And lastly, uh, we have our special collection streamer that on one side contains our standard usage and shipping conditions with room for additional item specific restrictions. And on the reverse side of the streamer has a mini condition report, which is filled out at the time the item is packaged and denotes any pre-existing conditions with the piece. And you can take a look at that too, if you like. So here are the links to all of the Big Ten and OSU documents uh, I've described. Um, as my closing thought, I like the analogy, and I've used this before, that some scientists and certainly our pop culture often talk about space as being the final frontier. And then you have other scientists like oceanographers and geologists who push back and say, hey, wait a minute, we haven't yet completely explored the Earth's deepest oceans. We've got a frontier right here in our own backyard. Well, some in the ILL community suggest that e-books are our final frontier in resource sharing. But I'd like to push back a little bit and say, wait a minute, we haven't yet plumbed the depth and richness of our own special collections for resource sharing. Well, we in the Big Ten Academic Alliance want to change that, and we're about to take a major first step working collaboratively toward that goal. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Brian. Um, just to wrap up before we open things up for questions through chat, well, we've been You've been uh, slowly supplying them to us as we go along. That's good to see. Uh, this slide echoes one of Heidi's because all of this bears repeating. Sharing special collections is a topic that can engage the emotions of even the most even-keeled library professional. Uh, concerns for the safety of special materials are, of course, completely appropriate, and there are sensible, responsible steps that, steps that can be taken to uh, ensure the security of the material. You don't have to reinvent the wheel if you're considering sharing special collections. Data, tools, and processes exist that you can adapt and build upon. Communication is paramount. When isn't it? It's especially true when discussing the, the, discussing the sharing of special collections. Get all the stakeholders together. Talk it out. Again, there are tools available to help guide your conversations. Work collectively rather than unilaterally. This is all about collaboration and building trust. Here are links to the resources we talked about today. Uh, a solid starter, starter kit for anyone embarking on the sharing of special collections. We'll make the slides available after today's webinar so you can uh, actually click on these links. 
Finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, um, give a shout out to my new colleague, Chayla Weber, who started as a senior program officer with OCLC Research just last week. <laughs> last year, as a practitioner researcher in residence, Chayla worked extensively. Oh, we've got somebody unmuted again. And one. Yeah. She does that with the them. Chayla worked extensively with the library. Yeah. Okay, now I get Scroll down. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I'm glad that these. Are <laughs> Sorry, folks. Got it? Um, yeah, I'll let you know. Right. The agenda addresses areas of inquiry and potential research and learning opportunities built on uh, building on recent work in the profession. Chayla's work is intended both as a roadmap for future efforts by OCLC Research and the Library and Archives community and as the start of an ongoing conversation about archives and special right. and distinctive collections. So I yeah. encourage you to uh -huh. check out this position paper and uh, welcome. Okay. okay, fantastic, bye. And thanks for listening. We'll turn things back over to Marilee and open it up to your questions and comments submitted through chat. Take it away, Marilee. Hey there. Um, so uh, we had one question that was specifically for Heidi. Um, and that was from Paul Constantine from University of Washington. Is IV Plus only doing scans or also lending returnables? Uh, that's a good question. Through this particular pilot, we're only providing scans at this stage. I know that there must be some sharing of special collections materials that's happening already, um, but I don't think it's happening on any programmatic scale. We are certainly going to be watching closely what the Big Ten is doing and hopefully having some larger conversations around that. Um, one, one thing I've been thinking about, um, and I've just recently begun thinking about this since the site visit at Stanford, was um, there, there's a lot of value, I think, in having a curator present for a conversation um, with the user to say, you know, well, gosh, I know you're interested in X, Y, and Z, but, you know, maybe you'd also be interested in A, B, and C. These are related. And so one thing I've wondered is, would it make sense to have sort of a visiting scholar fund or some sort of travel fund, especially since IV Plus libraries are so geographically distributed across the U.S. And so users, um, you know, if, it, if a researcher needed to come and spend more than a couple of weeks um, doing some research that it could support them in that. Um, so that's, that's an idea. So I'm really interested in the sort of the whole ecosystem of special collections and scanning is, is a piece of it. Sharing and shipping of physical materials is a piece of it, but also perhaps facilitating the use on site is another thing to think about as well. Thank you. I like that idea. Um, Gordon Danes from uh, BYU asks, what guidelines do you have for loaning manuscript and archival material? We are fairly comfortable loaning rare books, but manuscripts and archives are still a touchy subject when it comes to ILL. And he expands on this by saying, Part of the challenge is related to MPLP, um, less, uh, less intensive processing, and not feeling like we have a really great handle on exactly what's in every folder of every manuscript collection. We do scan on demand for non-restricted collections and provide those via ILL. However, that doesn't always meet the patron's needs. Uh, Brian, do you have any um, reflections on this, uh, drawing from your experiences at, at OSA or within the BTAA? Yeah, so I'm going to quote from the Big Ten Principles and Protocols uh, where there's a line that says, requests for special collections items should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis and independent of format rather than having a blanket rejection policy. So um, it doesn't matter if it's a manuscript or some other format of material. Um, you know, if the requesting library has exhausted all other possibilities and come back to us, we in the ILL office as the lender are going to consult with our curator and reading ahead, I think there was a, another question that came in on who gets to make the, the final decision and the answer to that is the curator. The curator looks at the piece and determines what is possible. We're not, we're going to try not to jump immediately to a no, but see, you know, how can we do this? Maybe a loan isn't the best option here. Can we offer something else? Uh, can we digitize it and send it? Um, can we invoke fair use somehow? Um, you know, we're going to try to explore all options, but it, it's the curator who makes that decision. And, and I have to say, there are some things because of their rarity or their value where we will just have to say no. 
That is an appropriate response in certain circumstances. Thanks. Nancy or I Dennis, do you have, or Heidi or Dennis, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, I'm just, I, I do recall when we did the survey back in 2013 that um, manuscript, you know, any kind of unpublished material was, was really uh, obviously an area of concern. And, and, and if you do decide to lend those things out, of course, some of it has to do with the value, but that's when you invoke that deluxe um, uh, yellow column where you get all your experts involved. And sometimes you end up having to treat those things more like you're, uh, instead of thinking of, interlibrary loan protocols, you start thinking about museums and the, the protocols that they've invoked for, for lending uh, artworks and stuff, and you have insurance and bonded carriers and that kind of thing. So uh, that's what we learned from, from the survey in 2013. This is Marilee, and I'll just comment that I think from uh, Gordon's um, question that he may be a little um, more concerned in addition to uh, the nature of the material that uh, because of the extent to which the collections have been processed that what they're sending may not be meeting the patron's needs. And I think that that gets into um, kind of a need for more, um, more dialogue uh, with, with a patron, perhaps. Um, but I think that that's a, a really good and intriguing question. Okay, Erin Murphy from Harvard has a couple of questions. Um, to what extent are your institutions utilizing existing staff in conservation, preservation, and exhibitions who are experienced in handling, packing, transport, and other administrative or legal aspects of lending special collections? Provide concrete examples if possible. <laughs> um, so, uh, Brian or Heidi, do you want to take a crack at this one? Yeah, this is Heidi. I can speak to the, the scanning perspective. I would say that we are, we're extensively using existing staff. Um, for example, um, we're using local digitization specialists. Um, we're really deferring a lot of the digitization, in fact, the bulk of the digitization to people who are already doing this work. In fact, there are often people who are directly involved in local digitization projects for prospective digitization. Um, and this is something that, because the volume has not been very substantially high or are simply able to sort of shoehorn into their, their current workflow in a way that's feasible. Um, I, we are definitely deferring to the expertise of, of the special collections librarians. That was something that was very important to us is that they did not feel in any way pressure to say yes to things that they really were not comfortable with. Um, but I think that the time piece is really important and this is coming up I think in a number of our questions which is, you know, how are you how are you working this essentially into your ILO workflows? And I think this gets back to the fact that you can repurpose the things that are working about ILL effectively, which is the request process and sometimes the delivery process for digitization. And you can repurpose what's working effectively about your high-end digitization programs in your special collections or digitization areas. But really, this is a hybrid approach, and you need to take what's working from both of those effectively instead of trying to sort of force this into one area or the other when it doesn't work as well. So I, I would say extensively for the scanning piece. So in the Big Ten um, protocols, one of our, uh, actually the principles, one of our principles is collaboration, and we have a line in, in, in the consortial framework document that says lending from special collections should be accommodated with existing resources and current staffing available at the borrowing and lending libraries. So we're all planning to implement this new document with uh, existing staff. Um, the framework is written broadly enough, though, that each of our institutions in the Big Ten uh, get to work out what the local workflow is going to be. Um, you know, is it going to be special collection staff that are doing the scanning? Will it be preservation and reformatting staff? Will it be the ILL staff? Um, the framework is broadly written so that each institution can determine that um, whatever works locally for them. Okay, great. Um, Boaz from Brown has got a really um, interesting observation. Can we consider sharing digital copies via a shared database? Um, uh, Amy Lynn from the Getty also pitches in and says, when digitizing entirety of public domain works, I, consider, I hope you can all consider contributing files to the Internet Archive 
to make materials more widely discoverable. And for art-related tiles, we'd love to have you contribute to the Getty Research Portal. Uh, Amy, I'll be sure to include the link for that um, in, the, uh, in, the, in the notes for, um, for this webinar. Um, so an intriguing observation there from Boaz. Um, I also want to note that Haven Hawley uh, has noted that Wisconsin has had a good model for loan of archival materials. And yes, uh, Wisconsin is actually um, one of the pioneers um, in this area. So uh, Yeah, when, when we did our literature survey in 2013, that's one of the things that stuck out. I, I, I wanted to give a shout out to Wisconsin. They, they had this in-state program of lending archival materials just around the state. and. Uh, that was kind of, we, we stood on their shoulders a little bit. That was a, that's a very impressive thing that they've been doing forever and, uh, and well. Quite, uh, quite influential there. Um, I want to close with one question from Paul Constantine to Brian, which I think is uh, really a good one to close on. Have all of your curators bought into the ILO concept? Are all willing to go from no to maybe? Um, so when we developed the local procedures implementing the Big Ten framework document, um, I gathered a team that included representatives uh, from all of our special collections because I needed the input from all of them to know, you know, what are the issues we're going to come across, what needs to be decided. Um, and so they all had representatives there who uh, contributed to this document. And it's a very strong document. I, I, I highly recommend that you go through and look at the OSU um, procedures document that I linked to. Um, you know, we have not yet implemented it because we just wrote it last week. We're hoping to implement it next month. Uh, but, but yes, I, I'd say that there's some cautious optimism. You know, we're still about wary about uh, what's the volume of requests we're going to get for these things. Um, but I think we've got a very good deliberative uh, plan in place, and we're going to give it a try, and we're going to tweak it as we go along. Um, but uh, we want to see this work. I think there's a commitment by all of us in all of the units here to, to make this work. And certainly our administration backs us up on that. Well, thank you for that. Uh, so I want to wrap things up today. Uh, we have recorded this webinar and we'll send out links uh, later on uh, within a week. Um, I want to note that this webinar has been sponsored by the OCLC Research Library Partnership. For those of you who are engaged in the partnership, we want to thank you so much for your continued support and input into our work. Those are both crucial to our success. Um, so thanks for your attendance and your forbearance uh, through technical difficulties, and this concludes today's webinar.